Matthew chapter 20. Now what we're going to do today is we're going to be actually taking verses 17, 18, and 19 together. And then I'm going to move into chapter 20, verse 20 through 28. In the past, I actually just concentrated an entire study on verses 17 through 19. This time, I'm going to actually have two installments, if you will. Verses 17 through 19 will serve to be the context for verses uh, 20 through 28. You're going to see that the Lord Jesus Christ in verses 17 through 19 is instructing his disciples concerning his uh, upcoming death, you know, and you'll, you'll, we will read that in a minute. But we're also going to see how his disciples responded to that kind of news. And so it's interesting how that Jesus would be speaking concerning something that is about to take place that is very serious, but it's interesting to note how that affects those who are listening. And so let's begin reading together at verse 17 here in Matthew chapter 20. I'll read to verse 28 and we'll get into our study. Matthew chapter 20, beginning at verse 17. Then Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify, and the third day he will rise again. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. He said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, we are able. So he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my father. When the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. As we look at this passage here, this gives to us, in verses 17 through 19, it gives to us uh, another instance of Jesus speaking of his upcoming death. Now, he'd already made mention of this to the disciples in, uh, you know, recently it's recorded that he had done so in Matthew chapter 16 as well as Matthew chapter 17. And so he's already been teaching them concerning these things, but now once again he's going to remind them of the events that are about to transpire. You see, he's about to be put to death, so his desire is for them to understand what is about to happen. And he knows that they're going to be shaken to the core. Therefore, he prepares them for these upcoming events. Now, we need to remember that the suffering and death of Jesus Christ was not an afterthought. It certainly wasn't an accident. His suffering and his death was the reason that he came in the first place, and it's repeatedly stressed in the Gospels. Now, it's been said that the, uh, the heart of the Gospel is John 3, 16 and 17. All of us have heard those scriptures. Many of us have memorized them. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's the heart of the gospel, salvation that has been given to us through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, God sent his son, his mission, Jesus' mission was to be born in order to die. 
He was the Lamb of God who takes away the, the, the sin of the world. And so Jesus came in order that he might voluntarily lay his life down for sinners. That's basic. We already know that. And yet, when you look at the scriptures, it seems to be repeated over and over again. And Jesus tells us why he came. Matthew 18, verse 11, the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Luke 5, 32, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so Jesus made it very clear, I came to seek and to save that which is lost. When you partake in that, when you understand that, then you can give a testimony concerning that. In other words, you speak concerning what you have experienced. You're able to speak concerning what salvation is. So that's why Christianity isn't just a system of philosophy or creeds. We certainly have philosophy. We certainly have our creeds. Of course we do. Our declarations of faith, we have them placed in, a, in categorical uh, ways so that we can say these are the things we most surely believe. God loves us. God sent his son. We can speak concerning creedal statements you know, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only son. We can speak concerning creeds like that, which contain the elements of our faith. So Christianity isn't something that is just something we feel. It's something that is built on fact. And, and as we look at that and we begin to partake in that, and actually as we by faith uh, receive those gifts and those promises and, and all and are born again, then we can, like Paul, make declarative statements related to how they've affected us personally. This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, Paul said, of whom I am chief, 1 Timothy 1.15. And we know, we know that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And Jesus said that's why he came. And so that's something that is very important for us to remember and understand. But his disciples need to be reminded of that, and it appears constantly. You see, Jesus is about to be taken violently from his disciples, so once again we see him instructing them concerning this. They need to be prepared for this, in order that when the time of testing comes, they can remain faithful to him. You see, the Lord intended his disciples to carry on his work into the future, so they need to remain strong and be instructed. And so that's what we're watching here take place as he once again begins to instruct them. So in verse 17 here in chapter 20 of Matthew, it says, Jesus going up to Jerusalem, took the 12 disciples aside on the road and said to them, something you'll find interesting when Jerusalem is spoken of when you're approaching it, it is always going up to Jerusalem because Jerusalem is a city that's on a higher elevation. And so they're always going up to Jerusalem and that's what's happening right now. Jesus is going to Jerusalem, going up to Jerusalem. Notice in verse 17 how as they're going up to Jerusalem, he takes the 12 disciples who are also the apostles. He takes the 12 disciples aside. So Jesus and his men are traveling with him, but there are others who are part of that group. So he wants to instruct his apostles privately. That's because some things that he has are for their ears only only. So he takes them aside. And he says in verse 18, behold, we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be betrayed to the chief priests, to the scribes. They will condemn him to death, deliver him to the Gentiles, the Romans, to mock, scourge, and crucify. The third day he will rise again. And so again, he had mentioned this to them in chapter 16. He reiterated it in chapter 17. He repeats it now in chapter 20. When he says, we're going up to Jerusalem, that causes the disciples concern because they know that Jesus is a marked man in the city of Jerusalem. When he was up in the north, he was a bit safer. But down south, where it was the religious hotbed, they knew that Jesus was in danger. That's something that was recorded concerning him all the way back in the Gospel of John in chapter 5. When Jesus was there and there was a man by the pool of Bethesda and Jesus had healed this man on the Sabbath and had told him to rise and to pick up that mat that he was on and to walk and it created tremendous problems because in doing so, Jesus was declaring himself to be the Son of God, which was blasphemous and also 
instructed the man to carry his mat, which to the Jew on the Sabbath you didn't carry anything because that was called working. So they believed that Jesus Christ was a blasphemer. And according to John 5, 16, it says, For this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. And so the disciples know that Jerusalem is a dangerous place for, for Jesus to go. They knew it. And yet his face is set to go to Jerusalem. They're concerned for him. And he's even speaking to them concerning what is about to happen. And that causes them great concern. Mark tells us in chapter 10, verse 32, they were on their way up to Jerusalem and Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished. Well, those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. So they were astonished and they were afraid. Jesus' joy and his determination to go there and embrace this cross actually confused them. How is it possible that you would have such a disposition when you're on your way or marching on your way to death and you're bringing us along with you? So his determination confuses them. But Jesus in Luke 12, 50 says, I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is completed. And so he said, no, this is why I came. I have a baptism to be baptized with. And I desire this to take place. And so he is determined to go to fulfill the plan of salvation. Well, on their part, they're so overwhelmed, they don't know how to react. And so Jesus is walking before them. He's their shepherd. He's their leader. He needs to lead them in. But they're walking behind him, and they're confused, and they're concerned, but they have to go with him. Now, Luke records that Jesus tried to instruct them in order to calm them, but they still didn't understand. In Luke 18, 31, it says, He took to him the twelve and said to them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. So what he's doing, and I want you to notice this, is he is bringing to them calmness, at least wanting to, by use of the Scriptures. The Word of God is intended to bring them comfort. You see, the, the disciples didn't understand that the, what the Scriptures said about their Messiah, so they're concerned, and again, they're confused. And so as Jesus is speaking to them, He tells them exactly what's going to happen. Verse 18, we're going up to Jerusalem, the Son of Man, which is a title for Messiah. The Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn Him to death, deliver Him to the Gentiles, the Romans, to mock and to scourge and to crucify, which was the Roman means of death. And the third day He will rise again. So He's given them details once again. There's going to be a trial, is what He's saying. I'm going to be betrayed to the chief priests and the scribes. We know who betrays him, a man by the name of Judas. He says they're going to condemn him to death. And that occurs on the night that Jesus was betrayed. He says, We're going to be, I'm going to be delivered to the Gentiles. They're going to mock and scourge and crucify me. And that's because the Jews didn't have the legal right to put a man to death, but Rome did. And then he goes on to conclude by saying, On the third day I will rise again. Now, with all of this that's being said, how did they respond? Well, according to Luke chapter 18, 34, the disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them. They did not know what he was talking about. Again, some things are only understood later after things unfold. I've said it to you before. Jesus said, said it like this. What is occurring now you don't understand, but you will later. There are some things that you learn later. You just trust the Lord and go through it, and then you discover, so that's why he did that, and that's how that worked. And so that's what's taking place right now. Now, that's to set up this. He's talking about his impending death and all that relates to it. And then how did they respond? Verse 20, the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? They said to him, We are able. 
So he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my, my left is not mine to give. It is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. And so let's look at that for a moment. What we have here is, notice, the mother of Zebedee's sons. She comes to him, she kneels down, and she makes a request of the Lord Jesus Christ. What we have an opportunity of seeing at this point is how deeply his lesson affected them and how it affects the way that they think. Everybody who leads, everybody who teaches, anybody who communicates knows that the listeners don't always hear. Listeners don't always hear. We know that if you're a parent, a parent will share with their children thinking that they're learning the first time that we speak, but they don't. They'll, they'll sit there nodding their heads when you're speaking to them. Do you get it? Do you understand? Oh, yes, I get it. They're not listening. I can still remember I was 17 years old, and my dad was upset at me, as was kind of normal in our home. And uh, I had done some stupid things, and, and he had me seated across the table with him, and he was, he was really attempting to get through to me. And I still remember as my father was looking at me and, and trying to lecture me, I was thinking of something else. I don't know what I was thinking of, but it certainly wasn't my dad. My dad was looking at me, and his mouth was moving, and I heard those sounds, but I don't know what he was saying. And, and it was obvious that I was just kind of like zoning. I was just kind of looking around, and, and then I'd look at my dad. And finally, I still remember my father looking at me and saying, you haven't listened to a word I've said, have you? I said, no, I've been listening to everything. Okay, what did I just say? So I made something up. He'd said the same things for so long, I just repeated what I heard in the past. Well, you were saying this, 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 and that. And he, my dad had this shocked look in his face. I still remember it. He goes, yeah, that's what I was saying. Well, I was looking. I, 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 I didn't know what he was saying. He was just, it was like his mouth was moving and other sounds were coming out. I didn't get it. See, so I know I was that way. I know none of you in here were, but I was that way. And as a parent, I have spoken to my kids. And I have said to my kids, this, 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 this. And, and I'm really trying to communicate. And they're just, mm -hmm, but they're not listening. So just because somebody is, is listening to words, they're not hearing what's being said. And that's what happens very often in the spiritual life. How many times can I hear a Bible study and still not get it? Still not get it. I can be well-trained. I can be in the Word of God every day. I can be prayer, meditation. But there are some things I still have yet to understand or to get. Why? Because I may be looking at one story, and I might be pulling a piece from that, and I'm not seeing the meat of something else that's in the same story. And that happens all the time. So we all know that repetition will teach and that's how Jesus repeats himself. And that's why he keeps on saying the same kinds of things related to his death, burial, and resurrection. They need to hear this. But how is it affecting them? Are they listening? Well, we see he's spoken to them. He's saying this is going to take place. And the first thing we see after that, at least recorded in Matthew, is the mother of Zebedee's sons coming up and saying, I have a question to ask you. I have a favor to ask of you. What is it? Well, I want my sons to, to be seated, one on the left and the other on the right in your kingdom. So these men who have just been instructed concerning Jesus being betrayed and, and killed, this shows you how they're affected by those things. I have a request of you. Now what's interesting is the Bible tells us that she may be presenting a desire shared with her sons, James and John, because in Mark 10, 35, Mark records James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. So it seems that there's a conspiracy here. It's not just James and John, not just the mother. It's together they're making this request of the Lord. Now, in order for us to understand what's going on, let me give you a couple of thoughts, some things to think about. The question you have to ask yourself, and it seems interesting in verse 20 how it begins simply by saying the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him. The question I have to ask is, who is this woman? Who is this woman who takes it upon herself to come and speak to Jesus Christ? Well, we're told that it's the mother of Zebedee's sons. So that tells me that she's the mother of James and John because James and John 
were the sons of Zebedee. So, okay, this is their mom, James and John, who are apostles. This is their mom. But who is she to come and speak in such a way? Well, when you compare various scriptures, if you take notes, you might want to note this. Matthew 27, verse 56. Mark 15, verse 40. And John 19, verse 25. When you compare those scriptures, you actually come to find out who she is. Her name is Salome. She was the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. In other words, she was his aunt. And James and John are Jesus' cousins. And so she is using her family relationship with Jesus to try and obtain favor through nepotism. And that's what's taking place here. She's the one making the request of Jesus, but it reflects her son's ambitions. I want you to remember with me, we saw this in chapter 19, verse 28, that Jesus had told them that they would have places of honor in his kingdom. So it's interesting to note how his promise of honor had been heard, but his suffering had not been heard. They didn't understand that the way, way to honor was actually on a road of suffering. The way to honor, I'm going to develop this with you. When I, when I do pastor's classes, leadership classes here in the church, and I do them every year or two, I'll, I'll invite some of the men in the church who have a desire to, to grow in leadership and all. I will have classes, and I do this all the time, as well as sharing these things with other pastors when I have opportunities to do that. These are simple principles of ministry. But when I do that, I, I like to remind the people of what we're called to, because these are the things that relate to your service to God. These are things that matter in the kingdom of God. I'll, I'll show you that in just a moment. And so one of the things that every minister of the gospel needs to understand that is that the, the road to honor is actually a road to suffering. If you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, you are going to go through things that are going to work on your character. I'll show you that in just a moment. There's nothing wrong with being ambitious for the right kinds of things. There's nothing wrong with having a desire to be, be used mightily uh, by the Lord. A.W. Tozer, one of my favorite writers, uh, spoke to a man who was, had a, a pastoral authority in his life and, and said that he wanted to be, and this is just kind of like a paraphrase, that he wanted to be a man who loved God more than any other man ever, who ever lived. And the man said, you realize, of course, that you are asking for suffering. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you need to understand that the road to greatness is paved with sorrow. You need to understand that. Not everybody does. A lot of people think, yeah, I'd like to be this, and I'd like to do that, and I'd like to be known. That's, that's part of human nature. And on, and on one hand, it, there's nothing wrong with the desire to be used mightily by God. You know, as you look at church history, you'll see that there were great numbers of people with that tremendous desire. Uh, somebody by the name of John Knox uh, once said something that is, has lodged in my heart. He, he was on a, a, a ship in a harbor in Scotland, in Edinburgh, Edinburgh, Scotland. And he simply made a prayer that is very famous. John Knox prayed, Lord, give me Scotland or I die. Now that's a great prayer. Lord, give me, give me Scotland or I die. I, I want to reach these people with the gospel. Give me Scotland. When you see men like Charles Spurgeon, in, in 1859, Charles Spurgeon wrote a book called The Soul Winner. And in the book, The Soul Winner, Spurgeon said, As Rachel cried, give me children or I die, so may none of you be content to be barren in the household of God. Cry and sigh until you have snatched some brand from the burning and have brought at least one sinner to Jesus Christ. Um, banned from preaching in the early 1700s in the Church of England for his preaching an undiluted gospel, George Whitfield was an eminently useful tool in God's hands. He was said to have preached to the majority of the people in the 13 colonies in the United States. Whitfield had a constant prayer on his lips, give me souls or I die. Whitfield coupled his prayer with no less than 30 transatlantic voyages, often preached twice a day all week long, traveled on horseback regardless of weather conditions, and received rotten eggs and manure as gifts thrown to him by detractors. 
John Hyde was an American missionary to India, desperate to change the face of the country where he lived, along with a state of fruitlessness in his own ministry. His biographers tell of calloused knees, nights in prayer, and they dubbed him Praying Hyde. The prayer on his lips was, Give me souls, first one a day, then two, then four, or I die. Again, fervent prayer coupled with sacrifice marked his life. These are ministers. These are ministers of the gospel that the church has yet to forget because they sought first the kingdom of God. And so that ambition that they had is a proper one. Their ambition was for the kingdom. It wasn't for their own glory. And that's the ambition that God intends for his children to possess. Not that we might be known as great, but that the God that we present is known as being great. And that's what he wants. That's what he commands of us. The mindset that they have is, is a natural tendency, the natural tendency to, to desire the attention and recognition from man. I mean, when you look at the Bible, you see there's a group of religious leaders called the Pharisees who did everything to be seen by man. And that's a natural inclination in people's hearts. But that isn't the way we're to serve God. In Philippians 2 verse 3, it reads, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. You see, they reveal that they have yet to understand how the kingdom of God really works. And what they're doing is they're attempting to apply pressure on Jesus by virtue of their relationship to him. They want position based on their being his cousins. And so it says in verse 20, she came with her sons and knelt down before him. Basically, she's saying it like this. I'm your aunt. These are your cousins. Surely you have a special place for them. But the Bible teaches us that the kingdom of God isn't made up of special interest groups. Well, he says, what do you want? And she says, I want them to be on your right hand and on your left. You see, that's a worldly tactic for greatness, using pressure for what you desire. People get jobs and they get positions because of who they know or who they're related to, but not so in the ministry, not real ministry. The Bible tells us in, in Psalm 75, verse 6, promotion comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. God is the judge. He puts down one. He sets up another. And so it's up to the Lord, and that's what Jesus is saying here. You're asking for something that I, I, I can't grant you. I'm not the one who puts you in those positions. My Father does. We need to understand that. You see, in this request, we see both good and bad. We see good in that she trusts that Jesus is able to grant her petition, but we see bad in that she's attempting to use her influence in a selfish manner. And so I want to develop this with you in verse 22. Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. You don't know what you're asking for. You don't realize the implications of your request. A request for glory is a request for suffering. In Philippians 1.29, it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for Him. Do you want to be great in the kingdom of God? You're going to go through deep things as you progress. I, I honestly believe that that's the reason why many people are content being lukewarm and hardly used by the Lord, because they realize that there is a cost. Some in this room understand exactly what I mean when I say this. You said to the Lord, we'll say one day, in one of those moments of fervor, you said, God, use me in any way. I just want to be used. And all of a sudden, you start going through trials that you've never experienced before. You start going through things that you've never experienced before. And you get upset. And you say, you know, I don't want to be used that much. I mean, if this, well, that's what it means to be used by the Lord, you know, I'm content going to church once in a while. Because at one time, you had a desire to be used by the Lord in a mighty way. You even felt perhaps called by God into a full-time place of ministry. But one thing after another after another began to accumulate in your life. 
And, and rather than learning that by going through those things, God actually has a way of removing from you the things that don't matter in order to replace them with the things that do, you didn't understand that. And as a result of that, you started thinking God's hand was upon you, not for good, but for ill. And because you didn't like that, you said, you know, what kind of God is this? Listen, when you ask the Lord to make you into a servant, he will. When you ask God to reduce you to nothing so that he can be everything, he will. And when he does it, it may not be pleasant. I promise you, many times it's not. Because let's face it, dying is not a pleasant thing. And yet we're to die to ourselves in order that we might live to Christ. And if we learn that, you will learn God's gracious hand, how he's with you no matter what valley you're walking through. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of, the death, of death, I am not alone. You are with me is what you learn. And when you learn that, you're able to help others who, who are going through that valley. I, I, when I was a young man, I went to a, uh, one of my professors, Dr. Moore. He was, he, I loved him with all my heart. He was my professor at Biola. I was going through a trial, and I spoke to him, and I said to him, Listen, Dr. Moore, I said, I'm going through some, some tough times right now. I, don't, I, I want to turn around and walk away from the Lord. I'm at that point where, where I'm hearing God say, you know, you, you want to go away. And I said, and I'm at that point where I want to. And he said to me, David, he said, you need to understand that this is part of how you are being purged to be used by God. You need to go through this in order that you can help others who will go through this. You've been there. You can speak as somebody who has gone through there. You can speak to them and say, God is faithful. He'll take you through. And if you don't learn your lessons now, these are lessons that are repeated through your whole life. Learn them now. I was 23 years old, 24. I'm still learning those lessons because it's true. Do you want to be used by God? Listen, we're in church right now. This isn't a, a show of any sort. This is church. Do you want to be used by God? If you do, you will die to yourself to live unto him. You will discover that. And you will discover that in the moments when you're weeping and crying and thinking nobody understands where you're at, there is a God who does. And though all forsake you, he never will forsake you. And you learn that. That's what you learn. And these disciples did not understand that. They didn't understand it. Are you able to drink of the cup? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism? Yes, we are. No, you're not. You don't understand what you're asking for. You're wanting positions of honor, but you haven't gone through the purging that makes it proper for you to have those places. You don't understand what you're talking about. That's a fact. In ministry, there are those who've never taught a Bible study who want to correct me and mine. It's a fact. I get the letters. I think Facebook is good, but it's filled with gossip too. Filled with gossip. It's unfortunate to see so many Christians who've got nothing else to talk about other than other Christians. Isn't that sad? We ought to redeem that. I have pastor friends of mine who said, why do you go on Facebook, man? It's just a gossip page. And I said, you know, I go on Facebook to try and bring the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ because Christians will, will read it, and that's why I'm on. But yeah, it's a fact, and you know this. And who wants to see what you ate today, by the way? I mean, Facebook. <laughs> Unless you invite me, I'm not interested. <laughs> but the bottom line is, that's ministry. That's ministry. You know what's happened to the church today? I'm going to be very honest with you as I speak. I always am. I'll say this. Bottom line, we are not looking for godliness in the pulpit anymore. We're looking for entertainment. Or looking for somebody who makes me feel good about myself or gives me information that I could get from a newspaper or from the news. We're looking for somebody to speak to me that way so he can instruct me on how I'm supposed to think. Listen, I'm not good at doing that. What I want to do is point you to Jesus Christ. This is what the Word of God says. It'll change your life. And if you read the Word of God, you will change. You will change. You will change. You will change. Because you start reading God's word and he said, this is what I want, this is what I don't want. And when you begin to see what Jesus went through, what makes me think that I'm not going to go through equal kinds, not equal, similar things? What makes me think that I will not suffer persecution? What makes me think that everybody's going to like me? What makes me think that I'll always be successful? What makes me think that every morning I'm going to wake up and I'm going to say, oh, it's a happy day. Listen, there are times I wake up in the morning and I say, I don't even want to get out of bed. I don't want to get out of bed. So Marie drags me out and throws me out and says, go. <laughs> because life can be difficult. Purging is not easy, but it's God's way. And these, these men, oh, we want to be on your right hand. We want to be on your left so that when people are looking at the throne, they'll see us too. And we're there. 
You don't know what you're asking for. You don't know what you're asking for. You don't. And sadly, many don't. Because he's speaking concerning what it takes. You see, you're asking for positions of glory, but are you able to endure what it takes to receive it? He speaks of the cup and he speaks of baptism. The cup and baptism represents the suffering and the death that he will soon endure. In, in scripture, a cup has a connection very often with a full experience, and often it is unfavorable. An example would be found in Isaiah 51, 17, where it says in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, Awake, awake, rise up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, you who have drained to its dregs the goblet that makes men stagger. So that speaks of the wrath of God. The cup can speak of wrath. We see in Matthew 26, 39, Jesus went a little farther, fell on his face, prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Let this cup of suffering, let this cup of, of wrath pass. Are you ready to be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? You see, drinking the cup would reveal Jesus' act of obedience, but being baptized was his passive. And he had said in Luke 12, 50 again, I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it be completed. They didn't understand. So what do they say? Well, we're able. People have a desire for position, but they don't understand the cost. They don't. It's like you walk into the we'll say a Kung Fu studio. You walk in and it's your first day working out and you ask the instructor for, for a black belt. It's my first day. Listen, I watched, I've, watched, I've watched a lot of UFC and, uh, and Bruce Lee is one of my heroes and I'm pretty certain that I'm, I'm a black belt already. You know, a lot of people have that attitude, I wanna have a black belt. Well, the bottom line is you start with a white belt. And over time, you begin with your basic experiences. You learn certain things. And before you know it, you're moving up into the different kinds of experiences that come with, with those experiences come with bruises and a lot, of, a lot of pain. And then years later, you would advance in your skills to earn something called a black belt. I have spoken to young, young men uh, over the years who will say things like, yeah, I'm going in the military, I'm going in the army. I say, well, you know, well, congratulations, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna be a ranger. Really? They're gonna just give you a ranger patch when you go in the day that, oh, no, no, I'm gonna be a ranger. And I look at them and I think, you know not what you're asking for. You don't know what you're asking for. It's not something you get just by signing up and putting your name down, I'm going to ranger school. I've had them say, oh, I'm gonna be airborne. Really, you're gonna be airborne, yeah. You know not what you ask for. See, I went through airborne training, so I can speak on that. And I can say, oh, really, you're ready to get up at six in the morning, you're ready to do PT for three hours, you're ready to run three miles in the beginning of the day and go seven hours of PT throughout the day, every day until you jump out of a plane. You're ready to do that? Yeah, I'm ready. Well, as I look at you, you may be. You may be an athletic, strong guy, but you don't know what you're asking for because you haven't stood at a door yet. You haven't looked at a red light waiting for it to turn into a green light. You haven't heard a black hat when the black hat says, stand in the door, stand, hook up, shuffle to the door, check your buddy's equipment. You haven't heard any of that. You, haven't, you don't know what it's like to stand and see it in a jet and see them open up a wind foil and hear the sound and the look and they say, I'm jumping out of this. You come on, you know. I, mm -hmm. And then you have people push you out the door because you ain't going on your own. <laughs> That's a fact. That's a fact. I'm going to be a ranger. Really? I'm going to be special forces. Really? You may be. And I hope you are. And I'll be proud of you if you make it. But you don't get the patch by just signing up. And you don't become known for being a servant of God until you've gone through the road. And that's what develops credibility. You know not what you're asking for, Jesus says. And a lot of people will say, yeah, I want the crown, but I don't want the cross. The only way to the crown is the cross. It's the only way. But you know what? You won't want anything less. And yes, when you are in the valley of the shadow of evil and death and all of that, when you're walking through it, it's something in your mind. I'm just walking through. I'm not living here. 
Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for God. You are with me. I walk through it. I don't camp out there. I don't live there. I pass through, and I'm not alone. You learn that in, in your walk with God. And that's what makes you... That's what makes you into a minister of a gospel that speaks of a suffering Messiah. Do you see that? Do you see that? We want this if you don't know what you're asking for. No, 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 we're able. Are you able? Oh, we're able. Uh, right now you are. But you'll discover something later on. You're not. You will indeed drink my cup. In other words, you will suffer for my sake all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, 2 Timothy 3.12 tells us. You see, James would be the first apostle to be martyred, according to Acts 12, 1 and 2. John ultimately was exiled to the island of Patmos, according to Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. You're asking for a position, but it is for those, according to verse 23, for whom it is prepared. Personal favoritism plays no part in the reception of such honors. You see, when God prepares an office for a man, he prepares the man for, for that office. Well, as this is taking place, notice verse 24, when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brothers. That got them angry. The other ten, how dare you cut in line? How dare you use your mother and your relationship to Jesus Christ to get positions of honor? Because after all, that's what we want. I, one of my friends was speaking how that, he was at a conference once and, and he said, there I am at a pastor's conference with all of these various pastors and Billy Graham was addressing the pastors. And he says, as I looked around and I saw all these men, I felt so sorry for them because he said, because they thought they were going to be the next Billy Graham he said, and I knew I was the next Billy Graham. <laughs> it, it, it's a position that God places you in. It isn't a place that you fight for. Unfortunately, we have a tendency today in the church world to reward the most fleshly. There are many, many ministers of the gospel today who are very great in the sight of God, who are pastoring and ministering in cities that, that have a small population and their church has 15, 20, 30 people, but they're faithful. These men are faithful. I have a friend of mine, a very dear friend of mine, who lives in another state, and he lives in a, a resort area, not as if he lives in luxury, because he doesn't. He's in his 60s, and he just recently was given opportunity to stop working so that the church could could minister to him so he's free to minister to the church. It's a very small congregation. This is a man who's a pastor. This is a man who loves Jesus Christ. This is a man that I've seen in his life a dear calling of God to care for the saints. Nobody knows his name, but except for one, and the only one that really knows his name well is Jesus. He serves the Lord Jesus, not for attention. And then you see sometimes, unfortunately, whether it be on television or whether it be on radio, people were speaking things that are nonsensical, not even scripturally solid or true, and yet they have so many people who are saying, oh, he's a great. I've listened to so many people over the years, and I say, but there's no gospel there. He's funny. There's no gospel there. There's, there's no Jesus. Where's Jesus in the midst of all these stories of your success? And yet the people, they are show up, you know, and it's a fact. Sometimes we just honor the wrong people. And we want that attention. So Jesus is dealing with this. And then finally, as we go into this, I'll show you the conclusion. It says in verse 25, Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Instead of selfish ambition, he's saying you are servant leaders. Because selfish ambition, this desire to push ahead of others, creates division. Proverbs 13.10 says, only by pride comes contention. But with the well-advised is wisdom. 
You see, this is not to be true for the church because greatness is the fruit of humility. Desiring to be well-known and powerful in the body of Christ isn't what we're supposed to be desiring. In Romans 12, 10, in honor, prefer one another. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 3, Paul said, uh, you are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and division, are you not carnal and walking as men? So Jesus uses an illustration here in verse 25. He says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. When he says rulers, he's speaking of the pharaohs, the kings, the Caesars, the mayors, the governors, even today, the presidents. He says that they lord it over you. The word lord, it speaks of ruling down on people. They hold you down. They crush you. They do everything in their power to rise to the top. They squash any who oppose them. They are what we would call today the bully bosses. They, they seek to stay on top, to diminish others who have talent. They actually harm production rather than increase it because, they're, because they, they become the standard of excellence. The best leaders encourage people to use their gifts and are not threatened by their gifts. Listen real quickly here. Here's a principle I, that you find in Scripture that I can illustrate in this way. There's a man that we all know who is the richest fella in the United States. Bill Gates. I don't know how much money he really has. Nobody does. $60 billion is what I've heard more than once. Maybe more, maybe a little bit less. I can't get my mind around it anyway. A number billion is so far beyond me. I mean, I, I failed senior math in high school, so a billion, I don't know what that is, but it's a lot. I know that. But he was asked, what is the secret of your success? You know what he said? He said, I hire people who are smarter than me. Isn't that interesting? I hire people smarter than me. That is a real good principle because you know what happens? You know this, you work. And perhaps you're working in a, an office or for a company where a person who's in charge is not as talented as some of the other people and yet he or she tells everybody what to do. And instead of encouraging the more talented ones to rise to the top and bring their, their gifts uh, to the company's good, they squash them because they don't want to be threatened by this person who could take their job. In our ministry here, I have met with my, my staff for many, many years, and I have said this to them, especially some of the key staff members. I've said, listen, do not be afraid of bringing in somebody who is better than you because as the pastor and the leader of this fellowship, I will admire your skills and the ability you have to bring somebody in who improves your ministry. The credit goes to God, but I will admire your ability to lead and to take a second seat. Do not be the one who squashes everybody because you want to keep your position. If you're a leader, be a person who sets people free so that they might bring excellence to the entire company. Here in my ministry, I want the next pastor who steps into this pulpit, I want him to be so much more talented, more gifted, better preach, it's not hard to find them, and, and to bring them in here so that this church, until Jesus comes, moves forward. I certainly don't want to bring somebody in who's going to reduce your walk with God. I want somebody to come in who's going to enhance your walk with God. I'm looking for that person to put in here. Why? Because I don't care about my name. I care about His glory, and I want God to work in your life. That's how it works. That's what God wants to do. And yet here we are restricting the movement of God and saying, who's going to move? Who's the next Billy Graham? Who's the next, next uh, Chuck Smith? Who cares? They're in heaven. They don't care right now. It's not them at all we're looking to. It's Jesus Christ. He's the Lord of the church, you see. And that's what he wants. He wants us to understand. This is so basic. So basic. But it's lost on so many. I want greatness in the kingdom. Really? What is that? Describe it to me, what greatness is. Oh, well, when you walk in a room, everybody stands and gives you. That's greatness? Kings do that. Emperors do that. No. Who's the greatest in the room? The servant. The servant. Strive for that. Father, reduce me to be like you. Jesus, you were wounded. You were a wounded Savior, a suffering servant. 
You used yourself as an example. You said, if I then, being your Lord and Master, washed your feet, you ought to wash the feet of one another. You taught us that the greatest in the kingdom is the servant of all. And yet you have disciples um, after an announcement that you're going to die who are arguing about who's the greatest in the kingdom, who wants to be on the right hand, who wants to be on the left. God help us. God help us. We're living in a time that that's been lost on people. Those who are great, the word great speaks of noble or distinguished, exercise authority. They completely dominate. They play the, the tyrant. Their insecurities drive them to hurt others. He says, no, it's not to be that way amongst you. Instead of seeing the rich and powerful as a model of greatness, look to the servant. The word servant, when he uses that word servant, speaks of, of a, a waiter, one who serves food and drink. In the Greek language, it's diakonos. The slave is the doulos, the one who gives himself up to another's will. And this is the one whose service is used by Christ in extending and advancing his cause amongst men. You see, the surest mark of a true servant is a willingness to sacrifice for others. And it's been said that God thinks most of the man who thinks himself least. And then he closes by saying this, as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Taking the lower seat is a way of thinking. It produces a way of life. It is a, a voluntary way of humility, and it produces peace in the body of Christ. Here's a question for you. How many churches split over people wanting to be the greatest servant in the church? How many marriages have broken up because the wife and the husband were fighting about who the biggest slave in the house was? How many families have been broken up because a son wanted to be a servant in his home or a father wanted the son to know that that father was going to serve that house? How many? You just don't see that. What happens in division in churches and what happens in homes is we usually will argue about who's more important, my wishes, my desires, my needs, the things that matter to me. Those things matter and the things that matter to you don't. And that's what causes the division. That's why we, we butt heads and that's why we end up saying, I can't love you anymore. I don't because it was about me. When in fact, I have never heard of a church split over people wanting to serve Jesus together and be the great servants. I haven't heard that. And I know you haven't either. Jesus gave his life as a redemptive price for us, a ransom for our sin. He was our substitute. And the ransom was paid to the Lord and he satisfied God's holy justice. So give up your life for the good of others. That's the highest form of servanthood. And we remember the words of John the Baptist when he said, he must increase, but I must decrease. Who is the greatest in the kingdom? The servant of all. Is that what we want to be? No. I would rather own the restaurant than work in it. And yet I've been to restaurants where the owner of the restaurant actually comes out, speaks to us, asks how things are going, spends time with us. And I appreciate that. I think this guy knows who his customers are. This guy made himself available. I appreciate that. I don't give him a tip. I give the servant a tip, the waiter, because they made sure that I ate. So, may we learn, beginning here, may we learn to serve one another, to see what greatness really is, there was only one. There was only one person. And I'll close with this. And I'm very serious when I say this. this is on, there's only one person that's worthy of all my attention and thankfulness, and that's Jesus Christ. And I appreciate those who serve him. May we serve Jesus together. May we learn to love Jesus and one another and be servants in the kingdom of God.